Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and the telling of tales as the late Elie Wiesel taught us so well, is at the heart of a culture's self-identity. The telling of tales is as old as humanity itself. And the tales which touch us, touch us the most are the tales that reflect the truths of human relationships, the joys, the agonies, anger, jealousy, greed, pride, and of course, sexual tensions and temptations and infidelities, as well as the truth of human courage and selflessness, kindness, caring, sensitivity, and of course, love that binds us in transcending relationships of friendship and parenthood and that exquisite romantic embrace that transcends time for all eternity. The poets have written about the intricacies of life going back to the Torah and the book of Genesis, which is all about the nature of human relationships, perhaps epitomized in the story of Jacob, the third of the great patriarchs of our tradition, and his stormy and steamy relationships with his brother and with his wife Rachel and Leah and Lavan and then with his own sons, and the complex dynamic between Joseph and his brothers. It's been the great dramatists of millenniums, from Sophocles to Shakespeare to Arthur Miller. All the great playwrights are simply telling a compelling story that elevates us by revealing a piece of our own human nature, our own longings and fears and struggles and triumphs through their own lens, through a gift of their own genius. It's all about the tale. In the medium of television, the tale is told on screen. They were once called soap operas, tales that went on for weeks and months and years with storylines that captivated American audiences. Then they became TV series, from Dallas to The Sopranos, to Mad Men, to Game of Thrones. And from the very beginning, they all share one special ingredient in common. They make us care about the characters in the tale. More than care, we often love one or more of them, feel they're part of our family. They're no longer fictional characters, they are people in our lives, so much so that very often the actors portraying roles on stage or on screen receive cards and letters addressed to their characters. And we all understand why. They've become part of our world, our lives. And we like them and we care about them. That's the test of a good tale. Do you like the characters? Do you care about the characters? Do you fall in love with any of them? And if you do, give credit first to the writers who craft characters who feel real, who evoke honest passions, who become part of our world as if they're truly in our lives. And then, even give even more credit to the actors playing those roles who have this divine gift of talent to be able to take words on a page and turn them into moments that touch us deeply, make us feel their pain, their hopes, their fears, their failures, and to soar in their triumphs and their happiness and in their finding moments of love. On this edition of L'Chaim, this very special edition, I have a unique privilege to be joined by three brilliant actors who've helped create an international <coughs> television hit that tells the tale of a family living in an Orthodox Haredi community in Jerusalem. 
a tale that takes us into a piece of the Jewish world most of us know very little or nothing about. The series is called Shtisel, the name of the family which is at the center of the drama. It's the creation of Ori Elon and Yehonatan Indursky, and it's the rage throughout Israel and throughout much of the American Jewish community. When it was announced that the cast of Shtisel would be coming to America, venues were sold out in mere hours. But lucky, lucky us. What an honor it is for me to welcome to L'Chaim three extraordinary stars of Shtisel. Dove Glickman, Netta Riskin, and Michael Aloni. And it is thrilling to have all three of you on set with me. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I am, I am in the presence of three great actors, and I am humbled, and thank you so much for being here. All three of you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank and you. let me tell you just a little bit about each of these three accomplished veteran Israeli actors. Dov Glickman plays the patriarch of the family, Shulam Shtisel. He's one of Israel's outstanding actors, playing in Israel's longest television show for more than 10 years, a weekly satirical show. Dov Glickman is the recipient of numerous Best Actor awards, including two Israeli Academy Awards for Best Actor for his role in Shtisel. Neda Riskin plays Shulam's daughter, Giti. She's also received numerous awards for a large number of Israeli films and TV shows. Neda Riskin also was responsible for teaching Natalie Portman yeah. to speak yeah. Hebrew with an Israeli accent Daniel for the Sinkle. film A Tale of Love and Darkness, in which Neda was also featured. And Michael Aloni. Michael plays Shulam's son, Akiva, around which much of the story of Stichel revolves. He's another enormous talent on the Israeli scene, an actor, director, writer, television producer. He's gained American attention for his role in Stichel, but his range of acting is reflected in another series currently available on Netflix called When Heroes Fly a dramatic thriller and award-winning series about four Israeli military veterans who reunite after 11 years in a daring rescue mission of a comrade believed to have been killed. Michael Aloni also hosts a popular reality TV show in Israel, and he's the author of four novellas, two short stories, and a collection entitled Love in the Age of the Flu, and again, <laughs> What a kick for me to be sitting with all three of you again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Dov, I, I want to speak with you first. By the way, we should get the obvious questions taken care of first. So <laughs> it's a, you do satire all the time, don't you? In Israel, are you know, known more, Dov, as a dramatic actor or as a, somebody involved in satire and comedy? I will, I will answer it uh, in a minute, but just I want to say that you said everything that can be said about uh, Stiesel, and you did it so well and so good that I want your text, when <laughs> they ask me about Stiesel, I want to study it and to say what you said just uh, now. You are so You have kind. nothing to say now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, are so you said everything. Okay. I must tell you that uh, most of the years I play, I knew I know more as, an, uh, as a comic yes. actor. Especially because of this program you mentioned before, which the name is Zeus, that is it, that it was an entertainment program, something like Saturday Night Live in a way, uh -huh. and it was really twice a week, and it was a big hit in, uh, in Israel for more than 20 years. So this is the main thing I know. But last year's, and I'm very happy for it, I do dramatic roles. Not just in Stil, there was Azuran, there was another. Yes. Uh, was it, a hard, was it and a hard Stiesel, transition for you? But I want to tell you, Stiesel yes. is the role who made me more satisfied than any other role I did. Because? It's the most thing, because it had so many levels. It was the hardest, because was I had it? to wake up five, five, <laughs> five uh, uh, early a.m. I have no sympathy in the morning, for you. And then they took me. 
and they know, and they uh, one hour and a half to put the beard and yeah. to put everything in the tummy. And, uh, so the beard and then was to, fake. And then to wear yes. the beard and the belly. Yeah. The All back. fake. And, the, and okay. then after it, more than uh, more than twelve hours to shoot. But that wasn't hours. the hard part. But the hard part is becoming. No, it was the hard part. Becoming, <laughs> yes. How hard was it for you to become Shulam? It was hard. I must tell it you. It was. I must tell you. What I had to do. Many asked me, "How did you prepare to it?" I learned my lines. You know, I learned my lines. Then I sat, sat near the mirror, and they made me shtisel. Everyone around they put me in bed, as I told you, the Paris, the the the, the Bali, the the, the 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 suit. And then I looked at myself in the mirror, and I said, "Here I am, uh, shtisel." And I found myself so close to him. You know, I always thought myself to be the man of the citizen of the world. I'm European. I'm because I'm uh, secular, and I'm not. I didn't grow in a family, in a religious family. Even my mother ate kosher because she was afraid. She said, "I am secular, but I'll eat kosher, maybe, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> for any case, to be in, 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 a, a little insurance with it." But I, I grew up in a secular family, so. I, uh, I thought, and then when I did Stiesel, I realized really that I am a Jew. He told me for good and for, uh, for, for, for wealth. He told me, you are a Jew. You know, they, they told me, you know, this uh, Orthodox of the stream of the Chalmers, they are, when they walk, they are moving from side to side. It's very natural to me. I mean, it would be very, a little bit difficult to walk like someone who goes straight. <laughs> or many things. So it wasn't really hard. And let me tell you, to, 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 I think that an actor has to be in a situation. And as you mentioned before, that there is laughter and desire and jealousies. And it is, it is this, it's about this, it's about relationship, it's about people. It's, and it's so, it, it is so deep what they did, the writers. They are genius, those yes, writers. It's really, it yes. is something, when I read it, it is something between the Sopranos and Bergman movies. Correct. You know, in a Correct. Way. Absolutely right. And what makes it more sharp and more deep that it's with people, because of their religious, it's not about religious people. It's about people, about family, about everything. The people there are religious. So they have their uh, prohibitions. 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 You saw? I told you I hardly know one You know language. English beautifully. So, it's with prohibitions, and to stand in front of God every day makes sharper all this psychologically issue that it is in Shtisa. Okay. With Dove raises a question I really wanted to hear from all three of you. Secular. 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 And now you're playing... Haredi Jews. And, and by the way, understand, and sometimes the audience falls in love with a character and thinks that the actor is that. So the American audiences watch The Sopranos. Well, Gandolfini is not a mobster. None of the people in the move, in the yeah. series, are mobsters. These are great actors playing mobsters. Mm. And Jews who watch here in America have to understand, you're three wonderful actors. You're playing... Already Jews, and then what you just said is so true. You're playing life. It happens to be in the context of Haredi Jews. And what I wanted to ask you, and then I want to hear your story, was has it changed the way any of you feel about being Jewish or about being Israeli? Because you didn't start. You said very well, Dove. You start as a secular Israeli, and this was a world that was foreign to you. You may even have looked at it askance. I don't know how the two of you looked at it. But has the experience of playing a Jew in a Haredi community, has it changed anything about the way you feel Jewishly? Has it changed any way the way you feel as an Israeli? Netta, what do you say? First of all, I wanted to say that um, about two, three years ago, I was walking on the street with a friend of mine my boyfriend at the time and we were I don't know hugging on the street and there was a, a guy walking towards me 
it was a Litvak, which this is a thing I learned on Stiesel, because I, I, I couldn't tell before if it was just black clothes and a beard that was orthodox. And he stopped, and he looked so shook. I mean, he was so, in, in a very bad way. And he asked me, are you Giti? <laughs> and I said, um, I'm net, but yeah, okay, I'll be Giti. And he said, he looked at me and he said, what a disappointment. I thought, <laughs> I thought you were real. Yeah. Okay? Oh. So I said, I, I am real, but not, not as Giti. And he said, no, I thought you were real. And he just, he, it really, I, I ruined his oh, life. Yes. I think. How did you feel? You said she's a liar. I, I, I feel very good about it ruining his life. No, because the, for me, the biggest compliment is that people yes. think it's real, you know, and, yes. and um, that means we did our job well, so. Beautifully well, by the way. Yeah. But also, my, also, you know, the, the girl who plays my daughter, Shira, she went to Jerusalem and some people asked her if she needs money. <laughs> uh, if they can donate money to her so she yes. can give it to me. Incidentally, this may not be fair what I'm about to say. And I gave thought what I want, but I, given that story, I want to tell you something. All three of your roles are very complicated. And that's true of any good role. When you talk about the writers, they have written tremendous storylines and great lines and great scripts. In some way, though, yours is the hardest part. Because Kiva is big, and Dove is big, and Giti isn't so big. And it's a very fine line. And you have done it magnificently. And what you've been able to do is create empathy, and this your character grows. And it's not like yours don't grow too, but yours. What if one watches the first couple episodes of of Shdisel, one understands right away who Akiva is. One understands right away who uh, Shulam is, and then it's interesting to see their own arc and where they go and they develop. And I cannot tell you how much I adore. I adore adore what you do. I adore what Thank you do. You. Thank you. I adore all of you. But there is something you were gifted, and it's interesting, you told me before we started on camera, you didn't even plan to be an actor. No. You're very gifted. But you do something magnificent. And I, and I hope everybody who meets you in New York and L.A. and wherever you go tells you what a fabulous job you did. So Thank the you. story you tell me of this cuss it on the street or gets all upset because you're not Neda. You are Giti. Oh. So Mazal Tov. Now I come back to the question. Yeah. Has it changed your own self-perception as a Jew at all? And boy, I'm not looking for an answer. If the answer is no, it doesn't bother me. I don't, I don't know. Look, every, each time I play a different role uh, yeah. and I can't always uh, become... Uh, I, I'm not taking it that much into my life. I yes. mean, I, do you want me to tell you that I... Um, I I became religious. No. no, no. I'm Jewish. I don't know. It's a it's a cultural thing. I'm I'm I grew up in a Jewish country, but you have to also to understand that in Israel, the poles are very extreme. I mean, the secular people and the religious people. Yes. They do not meet. Yes. And in the U.S., it's more. I mean, you can be somewhere like you have this cr strange thing called reform. What is it? It's either you're yeah, extreme right. ortho orthodox yeah, or you're a complete yeah. atheist. It doesn't go, you know? It's like water and oil. We don't mix, you know? So it was interesting in a way because it's a society that was very strange to me. I'd never talked to anyone from there. I'd never been to those neighborhoods before. I never, I, I, you know, that I had to be taught. I mean, we really are seculars. We know nothing. I, I don't know. Us, we we don't know how to be Jewish. Okay, we just have it in our in our passports or something. So uh, in our genes too. In our genes, yeah. But I don't know how to practice. So we had uh, uh, things that I had to. We had to learn like everything. Um, blessings, Shabbat dinner, how to sit, how to move, how to. They had to. Ah, you are talking about to rituals. Yeah, but we this. had to. Uh, That's right. We we really knew. There nothing. was no Shabbat in your home growing up as a child. No. Where did where you grow up? In Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv. Yeah. Where were your parents from? My mom's born in Israel. My dad's in Lithuania. Okay. And they were perfectly happy being secular Jews. Were they secular Jews? 
or were they simply Hebrew-speaking Israelis? Hebrew-speaking Israelis. That's very honest of you. But when you say you grew up and there was this enormous divide between the Chaloni and the Can Dati, yeah. okay, and you had no, I'm asking whether, do you feel differently about them? For example, do you say to yourself, you know, these were all foreign, it was strange, it was sort of stupid. Now it's not so stupid, or at least now I, I appreciate and I understand. Or has it done nothing for you in Look, that area? Look, I've got to tell it. you something that someone told me uh, on, the, on the LA, after one of our events in LA. And I don't know, I think this really touched me. Maybe it's not exactly the answer you want to hear, but it's, for me, that's the answer. She, she approached me and she said that um, she was, uh, all her life she was ashamed being Jewish and she hid it. And she's American. And I asked her why. And she said, because, you know, it's, it's an open country. It's liberal. But it's, it's better if you don't show, up, show off being Jewish. You know, if you want to succeed, change your name. If you, wanna, if you wanna become someone, just don't talk about it. Don't show it off. And she said, and, and since Stiesel, she's I'm telling everyone I'm Jewish, and I'm really proud of it. And, I, and she says, and what amazes me about Stiesel is that none of you is ashamed being, being a Jew. You just show it off, like the characters, you know? And you celebrate it. And I, it really touched me. I mean, I cried when she said it because, um, I mean, yeah, it is. If, if this is the, what the show makes people to be proud of themselves, she, and, you know, they, she told me it was the first time that I felt I was seen. Interesting. What's yeah. your, by the way, you grew up secular also? Uh, yes. Shabbat in your home? <clears throat> Very traditional secular Shabbat dinner. It's not about religion. It's more about um, tradition, as my cast members just said. Did you light candles in your home on Shabbat? No. Okay. We're not very strong. I mean, there are some dinners that we do, and okay. we do the kiddush, but it's not from? more like, it's not, it doesn't come from a very religious um, background. I what I'm parents, saying is, where, 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 from where what are your parents I'm, from? My parents, uh, Israel, and my mom was born in Poland. Okay, and they both also... They also see themselves as secular Jews. Yeah. And I asked before the question, do you see yourself as a secular Jew? Or do you see yourself as a Hebrew-speaking Israeli? I see myself as a human, first and for all. I know that I'm a Jew. <clears throat> I, I believe in my background when I know my roots. And I think that it's good to know where you're coming from, to know where you're going, and to know where you're at at the moment. I don't. I, I think what Stitzel did, and that's a great thing, because I heard you both mentioning it, the them. I don't like, I mean, what we are used to is, is what we're being provided from the media. And it's important for me to say that if we're now in a show and you know, our Jewish viewers who are, are watching, some of them might not be Jewish. I don't know what's the percentage. I guess most of them. But we have the chance that maybe I think Stiesel, with everything that we said about the show, made a great impact in the fact that it was able to connect poles in society and also connect human beings as for who they are. Because I think what plays mostly and most strongly in this series is the fact that it talks about humanity. Mm -hmm. We are all, you said it yourself in the introduction, it's, we're all having same dreams and hopes and disappointments yeah. and and to tell that human story where you have this you know you look on the other side you look on the other side always because that's what the media or or you're fitted from stories that you know that behind that wall there's this mystery of them and us and that divideness Stiesel somehow was able to create a bridge over it and connect people around it and so the ultra-Orthodox community was watching the show the same as the secular community. And imagine that. We're on Netflix now, and everybody's watching it. I'm, you know, receiving to my social media people from all yeah, over the world over mispronouncing the world, yeah. our series in so many languages, yeah. which is impossible for me to understand. Why would someone in Hong Kong would take any interest in an ultra-Orthodox community family uh, living in Masharim, practicing Judaism, 
Because they're humans. The definition of who you are is what are your principles? What do you live by? How good of a person are you and what do you want to send to the world as a message? I'm happy that we had the chance to tell a great story by great writers and also have like this tiny little side effect of maybe changing the perspective of other people mm -hmm. of how they see themselves and how they perceive this other side that they didn't know about and they only learned from other resources. I want to ask you the same question. Has, did your experience change your view of Haredi? Did it change anything inside you as, you as a Jew? In a way, yes. I want to tell you something. But some weeks ago, some weeks ago I read uh, an interview with an, uh, a Swedish man who sent here as, a, as an overseer for the, for the for the issue, for the Israeli-Palestinian issue. He's a Christian. So they interviewed him. They asked him about the, the, the conflict between Palestinian and Israeli. And then they told him, you are a little bit in Israel. What do you say about the polar polarization between religious people and secular people, especially between Orthodox? And, uh, and he answered her like this. Listen to me well. Mark, he answered her like this. I see now Stiesel, and I can tell you, you are so similar one to the other. It's unbelievable, he said, because I see Stiesel, and I know mostly the secular, and you are very similar. So, and I think he's right. That one thing I learned, he's right. We are not the same. No one is the same, but we are similar. And there are things that I learned that really... You have to be more patient. I mean, I think, for example, and this is politically a little bit, that they insist now in Israel that the Orthodox will go to the army. I don't think it's, it's right. It's not so important that many doesn't go to the army. It's something political. What do you want from these guys? Really, it's not. It's their world. In a way, it's another world. In, in a way, it's the same uh, world. And I, and I learned that sometimes, you know, when, when this, the real orthodox, the, the extreme from the Mea Shearim, even it's an hour from Tel Aviv, it's a little bit like Eskimos, you know, far away from there. You can see they are cynical, they have humor, they are laughing at themselves. We are really, we are really similar. And uh, we have the same humor, in a way. It's a Jewish humor, you know, and it's... A, that's why uh, they like it so much also. You know that Shtisa really also in Israel, it, it connected so many people because ultra-Orthodox people saw it on their iPhones uh, and smartphones and... Uh, kosher. Kosher right. smartphones. It's important to say. It's important to say. And uh, older people watched it, younger people watched it from secular, religious... It is a phenomenon. Yeah, it? It, was, it was amazing, yeah. I, I sat with my wife some month ago in a restaurant in Paris. And the waitress came to me and asked me if I'm an actor from Israel, which was very strange for me. I told her. She said, there are three women there. They think, three women, they think they know you, they recognize you. Can you? They came, those three women. They said, are you from Israel? Are you Shtisel? And I told them, yes, but I did you recognize me? They said, by the eyes, by the voice, they were three Lebanese women who were Muslims from Lebanon, who were on a vacation in Paris. And I told them, you see it in Lebanon? They say, all the Muslims say. It so touch us. They, they touch us so much, they say. The problem with the children, the family, with the Muslims. We are. So maybe I thought to myself, she said, can bring peace to her. Amen. I have to let the two of you go. You have another meeting. I'm going to continue with Michael Loney. I am hoping every single one of you watching L'Chaim right now here on JBS has already seen the series. It is for free on Netflix, both seasons. And if you haven't watched, you're missing something extraordinary. And 
you know, Michael, we, we talked about it. By the way, ago. if you did watch, it's pronounced, as you just said it, Stiesel and not Schitzel, which everyone <laughs> is calling it Schitzel. Are you serious? Yeah, that's everyone. Oh, Schitzel. That's how they uh, call me uh, across the street. Stiesel, Schitzel. Yeah. You're in America? Yeah, that's uh, mispronounced with a T, which is more like, well, you know. Yes, I know. In Israel, they get it right, don't they? No. Also, they're wrong. also mis Schnitzel. They're also always mispronouncing. I just came back from uh, Brazil. I did some work over there, and someone down the street, all of a sudden, a valet guy, imagine that. A uh, Christian Brazilian valet guy yells, Kive! Come right. here, I want to take a, I, he wanted a selfie. And that was incredible, you know, because it's just to see the effect of, and they call it schnitzel or something like that. It was like even hard for me to mispronounce. Interesting. By the <clears> way, <throat> it's interesting because we have the picture of you from the actual series behind you. Do we look the same still? Or You look the same from here on <laughs> up. I, I assumed that was real. Did you grow that for the, sh for the well, series? It's a, it's a, I have a cool story behind it. Please. So on the first season, as you mentioned, I'm hosting a big reality show in Israel. And for, for the beginning of the shoots, we shoot it for about six months. Yes. Um, but imagine we do it um, in a very small budget. It's a very low budget, meaning that you go on location, then you shoot all the scenes in the location, and then three months later, you'll shoot the outdoors of the same location. The indoors were shot in Tel Aviv. The outdoors were in Masharim, Jerusalem. Say, for example, I wake up with, uh, in the middle of the night because my dad is snoring, and I walk, and I know that I, I need to go to the balcony. The, First AD tells me before we shoot the scene, but Michael, remember, in three months from now, we're going to be in Jerusalem. It's going to be cold. This is summer in Tel Aviv. Three months from now, you've got to have a blanket with you. So I take a blanket with me, and three months later, we, we shoot the immediate cut from that thing that we shot three months ago. You've got to hold the emotional state of the character, and it's really hard. You've got to remember the exact um, state of mind that you walk through that door. Mm -hmm. But also, for editorial reasons, for the first season, I grew this beard. It's my beard. I had a really big, thick beard. And I grew the beginning of my payas. And what you see here is the extension, hair extensions, that they added, that they added to my, my, my payas. Well, where I was walking around in Tel Aviv, didn't really help with the girls, by the way with like a long beard and weird kind of hair, side hairs that were popping uh, here. And, and, and so I was shooting, came the, the, the minute that I had to shoot the voice in Israel. So they told me, listen, we can't have you like this. So I had to shave. But the little payas, I kept them. So hosting live TV show, the most viewed show in Israel, uh, we have like a group text message with all the cast and, and in the middle of the live show, we cut to commercials. I get like from everyone, hey, we see your payas. Like they jump because I used to glue them to the back so no one could see on the show. And for the beard itself, they had to really make a beard that would resemble, be, resemble would be the exact beard that I had because otherwise one. it would not. You know, so yes. they actually went and studied my beard where you have like hairs that are blonde or, or are darker. So you got like, they really hand like made the, the beard and it would have to be really adjusted to my real face. So they built like this cast around my face to really fit it as it was. And it, it, it's good. Which year do you think this is? First or second year? Can you tell? Is this the first or the second? That's the first. So that's your real beard right there. Yeah. No. I'm, for the second season, I had my real beard through the, whole, through the whole time. Oh, you did? Yeah, because I was like, I said to them, no more. <laughs> like, if you want, let's just do it, you know, after the shoots of The Voice, and we'll find the, the right time to do it. I was going to say again, as, as we just watched, again, a trailer of the series, that we're coming back to the same notion. The reason why, it seems to me, Shtisla has such appeal and Dove spoke about it as well, is that 
the story is just a human story. The context happens to be the Haredi world. But any parent can appreciate what's going on. Any child, adult child can understand. Anybody who's been in difficult relationships with an older parent, the grandmother who is, a, is in season one plays a lovely role, right? All of that's just humanity. And you've written, not only have you acted, but you've also written. So this is something you're sensitive to, yes? True. And if somebody were to say to you, look, I asked this question of you at the beginning, and, and I'm not yet satisfied with your answer. Right? Because what you did was you gave me a very important, beautiful answer, but it wasn't to the question I asked. I want to know whether you view the Orthodox so world I, I'll differently if now. If I changed my, that's the thing I told you. You asked me, what are you? Yes. How do I define yourself, yes. myself? I, and I told you I'm human. Yes. That's my point of view. I don't, I don't judge anyone for, for I'd say, I, I, I don't want to say the cover of it, but it's like, I don't judge um, the other side. I don't see people as, because they, their, their culture, there's a cultural difference between us, and there are things that might work differently in our society. I don't see, I've never looked upon the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel or anywhere else in the world or any other religion or community for that matter in a way that is judgmental and, 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 and having this previous knowledge of who are these people. For me, someone that I just see or is, is first and for all, like me, a human. And as an actor, for me to explore a world that I don't know. We shot, uh, when Heroes Fly, we, we went all the way to Colombia. That's a different culture than we have in Israel and even here in America. You know, there's a difference between different parts of the United States and there is a cultural main big difference between Israelis and Americans, you know. Sometimes you hear a conversation between me, Neta, or Dov, you know, there's just two Israelis talking in Hebrew down the street. People think that we're fighting. That's actually having a conversation, but that's a cultural difference of how you express yourself. Or, so there's the immediate cultural difference between ultra-Orthodox community and a secular community because it's something that is visible and it's something that is opinioned by other media instruments to, for us to accept the fact that there's a border and there's a line that divides mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. But from where I'm coming from, and I came to this series, it didn't change anything in my point of view of, of how I see the other side. It just enriched me with knowledge that I didn't have before about the culture. And of course, restrictions, rules, prayers. I, I mean, you know, the last time I put on my tefillin was my bar mitzvah. So I had to learn everything from scratch. And in even body language, or we wanted to, this to be as authentic as possible. So, so, so we explored this whole world from, from, from down to, like, up and inside and out. It was, it was intriguing. As, if, as, as these are the kind of roles that I'm always thrilled to jump into as an actor because it gives me the option to really learn something new. And it's, it's because the world is so far away from, from where I am. Actually, it's 40 minutes away by car, but in cultural differences, it's so far from, from where, the way that I live my life that it's, it gives me the, this chance to, to learn and to enrich my, my knowledge. Okay. But you say it so beautifully, I want to know the extent to which you believe your perspective is typical of a young Israeli in his 30s. Typical about what? 
what we hear all the time is that there is a growing divide of bitterness between the Chiloni and the Dati, between the secular and the religious. Not just there. Yeah, but the, let me, let me, dividing people is easy to do. I it's understand, easy but to I'm talking about a specific divide. And, you know, Dove referenced it at the end. One of the issues that's big in the American Jewish media is the extent to which the ultra-Orthodox will agree to some kind of draft. And our understanding in America is that one of the reasons why Netanyahu was not able to form the coalition government this time was because Avigdor Lieberman was adamant that the Dati, Haredi Jews, should be serving in the military, and the Orthodox parties didn't want it. I'm told all the time, Michael, that Jews your age in Israel, young secular Israelis, are angry at the Orthodox because of the laws of marriage and that you can't choose who will be the Masada Kedushin for your wedding and you might have to go to Cyprus or America or Colombia to get married. And I'm told that young people your age in Israel are angry now at the ultra-Orthodox. And so I'm asking you two things. To what extent is the description I hear, in your view, accurate? And to what extent do you feel you are typical of your age, your age group in Israel? To what extent do you think you're atypical? I don't know. It's for someone else to judge. For me, as I do join a project, say Stiesel, say I did a film that was well received here as well, Out in the Dark, tells another story about the gay community and a romance between the both, like two sides of the conflict. And there are subjects that are dealt with as, as people who, who, who wrote the film or the series. And if, if sometimes you know, the message they're conveying, it's not for me to carry um, the flag for, for, I don't know, uh, raising uh, uh, or giving an answer to resolve in, 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 a, in, a, in a political matter. I will leave that to who okay. is actually I, running, right, running that, that, I don't that, need, that show. I don't need you to resolve anything for I me. Mean, I want to know, but I do need you to describe something for me. And what I'm asking you is, and the answer could be what you said at the beginning, I just don't know. And if you just don't know, you just don't know. But, but to the extent to which you do are aware of what's going on around you that troubles you, does it trouble you that... What troubles me yep. is that, and that what we're talking about now is taking groups, not just in Israel, everywhere in the world, and dividing and dividing and dividing and creating walls and sides and which sides are you on and what this side does to you and this side. And we, 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 we kind of like dig holes to make ourselves rooted more in our opinion and create and deliver more hate to the world. That's easy to do. The hardest, more invested, long-term work that is the hardest work that is, that is need to be done, and it's the hardest that to, to do, is to love. Mm -hmm. It's just easy to hate. To love is a much stronger and harder way of, of, of sending that message. You think it's easy. It's not. Then I want to ask you, a tougher question in my mind. And again, it's a question I wrestled with as I watch Stiesel. You know, you're a writer and an actor. So you know that what the writer tries to do is try to write as honest a reality as the writer can possibly write. But the writer knows that there's always some limitations because of the art and because of the medium, in this, in this instance, television. And so I had people who have 
who did the series Fowder. Are you familiar with Fowder? I heard about it. Okay. And I said to somebody who was in Fowder, and he was part of a, a similar combat group before he became an actor. And I said to him, well, I know the guy. Okay. What extent of the series that we watch is real and what is made up for television? He said, we do a pretty good job. I think about 70% is real. And I thought that was an honest answer. So I'm watching Stiesel and I'm saying to myself, I wonder what the answer is to that series as well. Are we romanticizing a world of Haredi Jewish life, which if I had a Haredi Jew here, would say to me, I'm glad this diesel, it's nice, but there are things about it that are not honest. And I want to know if you have any feeling about that one way or the other. As you look at the series, are, do you think it is a romanticizing of a world which is complex, complicated, and of which there are things that make you soar and things that make you say, you know, this is some of the lesser aspects both of the Jewish world and humanity? The answer is easy for me. It, it represents almost 99.9% accuracy of, I don't know if this world, but Netta said that when she spoke about how people were somehow disappointed to realize that she's not real. And it, you know, it happened to me too when we were shooting the second season. It was shot with a hidden camera because we can't really have a camera in Masharim. And for the first season, no one recognized me. And for the second season, people were like, Kiva. Come here, I want you to meet my daughter. Which, which was harder for them to, do, to differentiate between the character and the actor, meaning this world for them, and coming from a lot of people from that community that I spoke to, was represented for the first time through the eyes of, of, of actually so authentic, in, in the most authentic way possible, and not judging. That's lovely. So, yeah, I think you mentioned all the series that you mentioned before from my favorite series, you know, it's Sopranos, and, and, uh, and, and you, you gave a great example with uh, Mad Men. I always, when I read the pages, I thought Sopranos, and, and, and especially at the time because I was watching Mad Men, and such a great series, and it resembles in my mind somehow the Stiesel in the way that it's just planted in that world in the late 60s and 70s throughout like the 7th, 8th season. But I mean, so in that world, um, you know, the way that, that women were treated and the way that America was at the time and the way that people dressed at the time, walking here on Wall Street with, with you know, hats and, and smoking everywhere the cultural difference between how we grew as human beings evolved and changed. But the series, well, it raises the questions of, of you know, time and what changed. But it's just about these people. And it's just placed in that time. And I think Stiesel, in a way, is the same as it's just placed in that community. He's not trying to say something about that community. It's not looking to judge or raise the question of what we think about the Ruth Orthodox community. I think you said it yourself. People fell in love with this series not because of the sexiness of mysterious closed community. Even though it, it was even you know for me hard to accept how will people wa will wa will want to watch it. It's not uh, as you said Fauda or When Heroes Fly. It's not like a big action, a lot of. I don't know, you know, romantic sex scenes that you get on, on, on your regular screen. It's, it's a hard topic to pitch to someone and also has Yiddish. So I think creating that feeling, feeling that feelings at, at our, in, in our viewers' heart and, and mine, and, and it's because of, of the good writing 
and, and delivery of, of true, honest, real people that you can identify with. And it doesn't matter that, well, in, in our case, are, are in Mesherim. And I told you before we went on camp, you are beyond brilliant. And what you do with this character and how you show a range of emotion and the viewer understands is a real gift you have. Thank you. How the viewer understands what's in this guy's heart and mind. And you should know, by the way, the softness you see here of Michael is something that is real. It's off camera as well. But you're able to convey softness in such a way everybody falls in love with you. By the <laughs> way, you know, you're, you're, you're a marvelous, you're a good-looking guy. You're young. Oh, thank you. you are a heartthrob. You become a heartthrob. <laughs> did you ever see your, did you know you were going to be a heartthrob? <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. <laughs> How do your parents feel about this series? Oh. <laughs> How did your mother feel about the fact that her son is now a heartthrob? <laughs> My mom's really happy. They're really <laughs> supportive. <laughs> I guess I guess she's just uh, sitting now with a big smile on her face. Well, I hope she is. Um, I want you to tell me what, a little bit more on camera what you mentioned to me off camera. When you were in, you go to high school, then you go you serve in the IDF, or what do you do after yeah. high school? Yeah, yeah. That's what, what you unit? What unit? What unit? Combat unit. We're not going to that. We're just not going to that. Okay. Was it hard though? Um, was it hard? Yeah, I mean, it's just what you need to do. Okay. It is what it is. You come out of the IDF, now you, and do you travel after that? Where do you go? The year after, the minute you get out of well, your you know three the years. you know tradition. Yeah, I do. That's why I'm asking. Oh, so for our viewers who don't know, well, after you serve for three years, you tend to go for this journey, uh, either South America or India, to just travel for a year and forget about what happened in these three years. Where'd you go? Um, well, I just started saving money to go. I worked, you know, everything that I could put my hands on. Okay. As which, you get out of those three years, do you plan on being an actor? No. What do you plan on being? A uh, scientist. And where do you study? I study, in, first in high school, I was like considered to be this uh, bright student of, I am sure. of the mathematics. I am sure. I, you're not, to be sure. I know it's hard to believe. I was once smart. <laughs> it's not to take for granted. Um, You're still but then, very uh, smart. you know, that was my journey. That was my path. For then how do you end that, up in? So I started telling you. Yeah. Um, I was working to save money for my uh, round trip, and um, and I was working in constructions and bartending, everything that I could just possibly do. And then I worked as uh, this guy in the mall that hands out flyers. And the casting director uh, took one of the flyers and she pulled me close and so she said, listen, I want you to read for something I think you'd be perfect for. And I'm like, what? I'm casting this series. Are you in? I was like, I don't know. How much do you pay? And for me, it was only saving money for, for this journey, for my, for my trip. Uh, anyway, I came in. I got the part which I didn't know what it meant at the time because it all... Oh, what was the part? It was a great TV series for kids that went become a hit uh, in Israel. Everyone was watching it at the time. Because what was the, the theme? The theme was like, imagine, say, 90210 with superpowers, saving the world. So it's kind of like a sci-fi based on a youth television Kind of show. And this casting director just liked the way you were handing out flyers? I don't know. I guess she uh, just she saw, saw something. She saw something, right? Which for me was, you know, something that I've never thought I would do. But then all of a sudden I found myself with a group of actors that that's where, that was their dream. That's what they wanted to do in the first place. And they were like, for me it was just scary. Because it, it, it became such a great hit. I couldn't walk the streets anymore. I lost my, you know, my, my private life all of a sudden. I hated it. But what I loved was for me to uh, be part of, of the craft itself. It was always interesting for me to solve a scene or how to like approach this moment. And the scientist in me said, you know, well, if you really want to do it, we'll do it in a lab. That's what I did. I went for uh, three years in acting school. 
Did you? Yeah, I closed it like a conserva conservatory acting schools. You have your Juilliard and stuff like that. It's yes. Like, not very LA, but more kind of like London, New York <laughs> yes. way. And uh, I invested myself there. I like shut down the door and, and pushed back all the offers that came with the great success of the show. Yeah. So you gave up opportunities to study. Yeah. Good for you. To study acting. Yes, I am. <laughs> not <laughs> physics and, and, and math. But does it mean you fell in love with this craft? Yeah, I figured this is maybe something that defines me and this is maybe it's something that I want to do and fills me with joy, which it does in the case of, you know, great series like, like Stiesel and, and a great artist like Stiesel himself that is yes. reaching out to the world with his, with his inner soul and, and, and artistic dreams. Okay, just understand, Michael, you're doing the exact same thing. <laughs> I you, guess you that's are, why they cast me for that role. I don't know. You are a gift. You are a gift. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and when does the writing come in? Because, by the way, you have a long, you don't do one thing. You, no, I get bored from that. You act, <laughs> you write, you produce. Yeah. You've done TV, you've done film. So at what point do you want to become a writer? Or how does that happen? I, I never wanted to become a writer. Just like uh, you never wanted to be an actor? I, I, it was for me, I was writing. I was just writing. It was a thing that I was doing. It was like uh, from a very young age, I think I had, uh, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, Dear Diary. Today I had, uh, you know bad food, or whatever, like kids bother me. Well, it's not the, you know, it's not the kind of writing that I was doing. I had like this weird imagination. I still ho have all those pages uh, that I saved from when I was like 10, really stories. Some of them are actually in that book, by the way. Um, the name of the book is? As, as you said it, it's Love, Love in the Days of Flu, which is kind of like, um, has this take on Gabriel Garcia Marquez's book, which I adore as, his writing and my hero in the first novella is kind of like lost as his hero throughout the book, but mine is is in the modern age and suffering from from the the, de the disease of technology. I would say the flu of of constantly being in on screens and and looking to find a, a resolution for his lost love through her emails and 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 you know Skype and connecting to her old devices and it's just lost in, in, in our own techno tec like technological world that, that we, we, we are wrapped in. So for me that was the initial uh, targeting uh, of, of the story where I, I took my hero to and mm -hmm. yeah. Artistically, what would you like to do now? What's next for you? Hollywood. <laughs> good for good for you. No. Good for you. By the way, and, and I'm going to be on your Broadway show. What are you talking about? I mean, you just uh, they came up with the idea of uh, taking Kiva and making him a singer in a, in a Broadway show. Let's do it. I see the poster already. <laughs> I heard Beetlejuice is great, so uh, is. congratulations. I'm oh, I want you to go see Beetlejuice. Yeah, we're going to watch be my it. guest. And I'll be there, and I'll come on stage and <laughs> say, Kiva, Kiva, Shtisel, Shtisel, Shtisel. See, it's hard to say Beetlejuice, but it's also hard to say Shtisel three times in a row. I wonder, by the way, when you walk into the theater at, at the Winter Garden, whether everybody's going to say, Kiva! Yeah, it's going to be scary. You know, <laughs> aren't you surprised that people recognize you, as Dove said the same thing, that you're recognized without the beard and the makeup? You're, you're, noted, you're are recognized. The, the thing is, because there are two shows now on Netflix. Well, well thank you, Netflix, by the way. But it's uh, the fact that they picked up When Heroes Fly and Stiesel is at the same time, by yes. the way. So I had, first I thought people would watch When Heroes Fly and would be obsessed with it. And maybe they'll find out about Stiesel. But it kind of like became the other way around. Yes. And Stiesel was on the platform before and people just started watching it like crazy. And then when they finish, they have this algorithm that pops the other show that you need to watch to just keep on watching <laughs> for your entire life. So you get, you know, when Heroes Fly, and, and I get to my social network, I get so many messages asking, wait, are you the same guy? It was, they really didn't believe because I look so different. Yes. And, the and you play a different so, character. Yes. Yeah, you say, like, the softness of this guy is not, is not existing in this guy that is on When Heroes Fly, which is uh, dealing with this tough PTSD trauma that happened to him in Lebanon, which is, 
another theme that we can explore, but I think we can't just speak about Shti. So, but I mean, the fact that it was like so different for them, they couldn't get it. But now when they did the, uh, you know, in their mind, they kind of like attached those two characters together, then yeah, they can sometimes, you know, recognize me here um, on the other side of the street even. It's amazing. Yeah. In Israel and in America, yes? Yeah, and I told you also I was, it was Brazil. In Brazil. Sao Paulo, this, you know, it's, how come? It is amazing. Yeah. I understand the perspective you bring, and it is, it is, it is inspiring. The no, your notion is there shouldn't be boundaries between people. There shouldn't be fences. There shouldn't be lines. There should be love and not hate. Love and not hate. What I'm trying to understand is how do you, Michael Aloni, view yourself as an Israeli, does it matter to you at all that you are not simply a person of the world, not simply a really a great artist in many fields, but you also are an Israeli who had a bar mitzvah and put on tefillin? Where does the Israeli Jewish part? Because what I'm, you know, do you know John Lennon's song, Imagine? Oh, yeah. Okay. And there's a song which says basically there should be no borders and no peoples. Yeah. And the problem with that is if there are no borders and no peoples, the idea that we should all be one, as lovely as that it is, there's also a price we pay. If there's only one, then there's no individuality and there's no peoplehood. And for the Jew, there's no Jewish people and there's no state of Israel. So I want to understand from your perspective, how do you sort of balance, on the one hand, this, your enormous drive towards, I want there to be oneness and love. At the same time, you are, you are a Jew, and you are an Israeli. I have, I have an answer for you. Um, first, you know, today, we're at the point that the world, we don't know where it's going yet. The crazy times, you know. Um, and also, you got inventions like Bitcoin. That their intention was initially to just create and uh, wipe those borders out, um, which would not go into that philosophical question about will we be one? Is there oneness? I believe in oneness, as defines us as humans, first and for all. What are you? I'm an Israeli Jew. But before that, I'm human. That's what defines me. You can be. Uh, as this guy that stopped me in Sao Paulo, you can be a Christian Brazilian, for all I know, you know, but you're human, person for all. That, that is my answer to you of, I don't think we're all special. We're not the same, but to understand that I'm not judging the other side for his beliefs, his cultural background, I, I first just, believe that the other side is human like me, just has another mm -hmm. cultural upgrowing and definition in his life. Doesn't mean that we need to hate the other, the, the other side. What I'm asking for myself is not to judge and to respect, if not to love, to respect the other side. Yofi. Perfect, perfect. All right, we only have a few minutes left. It would not be right for me to have you on as a cast member of Stiesel and not ask you the question everybody asks. So you shot this in. Did you shoot it actually in Mea Sharim? Yes, we did. Okay. Some of it. Not okay. all of it, yeah. So how did the Mea Sharim community receive the fact that, hey, there's a television crew filming all over this place? Well, some of, some of the areas where um, we had to take the whole crew aside and have the makeup artist, <laughs> imagine uh, the, the, the makeup, makeup artist, she's a woman, and she comes to Dovo to, to fix his beard. As imagine that happening in the middle of Masherim. You know, a woman fixing someone, like a full-on Haredi guy, in, you know, it happened once. We got kicked out, um, um, but we learned how to 
managed to build the camp aside from where we're shooting. And some areas were more welcoming than others. And some of them, which is really close streets in Mesherim, we couldn't really shoot openly. We had like a hidden camera. We really had a vehicle. As you imagine, a hidden camera. We had earphones. And um, the director were, was telling us where to go to stand in front of the camera. And we actually just made the scene as if you, know, you don't see the camera anywhere else. It's just almost to yourself. Funny thing was that real people were actually joining the scene. So in the first season, I think it's the first episode, Kiva's out there hanging papers to advertise his new uh, gmach for, uh, for the heaters. So he's hanging all those posters. And some guy, and it's inch measuring, some guy approach, approaches me and he asks, but where do I get the heaters? And like, where's your address? And is it a, is it, is it a heater or an oven? What do you mean? And he kept on going, and it's in, in the show. The scene is that this guy is actually in the show. Created a lot of funny situation, uh, situations that were, like, real. And very often, the people we see on the street, in an American movie, they're all extras. In Shtisel, Most of them these are, are all, extras. Mo most of them oh, are most extras. Are yeah, extras. paid extras. But some situations, like I just described, did happen. Okay. Yeah. Was there ever a problem with women in the cast or the crew? Um, yeah. I mean, if you have an actor who's really uh, a full-on orthodox uh, guy, then he can't really have a makeup artist. There's a woman? Yeah. Okay. But did, at, at any point, did the community say to you, we will let you here, but we do not want women in the crew. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. You just had to respect the rules of, of the place that you're at. You know, you couldn't come with, a, with, with shorts. And you didn't. No, did. not, yeah, none of us. Right. Which is respecting where, so you, okay. you had to communicate like a, a mail that was forward to all of us and the crew members that we're going to shoot in this neighborhood. Please respect the rules of this, uh, of this community. Do not come in, I don't know, you know, eating bacon in someone's yeah. face. You know, it's just, it's, it's being, that's really just being I mean. Understand. And the reason I ask is there is this rumor going around that the women who were mem cast, who were in the crew of Shisel had all kinds of trouble in the cast. The crew had to figure out how to do it. And none of that was, you already knew how to behave in Mea Shireen. Yes, I think we had, um, 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 I think we had a growing uh, uh, learning appreciation, right? Stage yeah. where, that we had to overcome at the beginning, learning that we need to think about these things before. But, but most of the time, it was handled respectfully and good. And, and in a good way. Some of the situations were not, by the way. There are stories about how we got kicked out from certain neighborhoods because, you know, people just didn't like the fact that we were there. And we can understand that, too. Yeah, that's understandable. Yes. It's just when you have uh, 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 all, all your authoriz authorized documentation, then... Did you meet the go. two authors? The what? The two writers. Did you meet them? Of course. What's wrong? Good friends of mine. Are they good now, friends? Now, yeah. They, they, they gave us one of the greatest blessings of all, which is this show. Which the is script, For me as right. an actor, I kiss the pages. Like, who's, who's the writer? What, who wrote this thing? Okay. So since you now feel you know them well, and I don't have them here, just talk to our audience just for a moment. One comes from an Orthodox community, correct? True. The other does not. Not from the ultra-Orthodox community, but he is religious. But not Haredi religious. No, but he knows his neighborhood and where he grew up. I, I think he's okay. is, is full aware of the of the of, of okay. the, that community and how they live. Okay. But did you Onatan write this out of his own experience? Do you know? Most it's like okay, we're going back to the fact, you know, of writing. Yes. And if you every time that I write something, some of it is is a made up story. And and a lot of a lot of it is just me in those words. And I am 
I can't answer for them, but I know that their hearts, I don't know if one-on-one -on -one the story, but the relationship and that they know so well from their, what they experienced on their own flesh is just there in, the, in, in those words. And they did a fabulous job, didn't they? Just <sighs> fabulous, fabulous, yeah. fabulous job. They're just great writers. So now you come to America. How many cast members in addition to the three of you are here? That's just the three of us. Three of us. Yeah. Okay. And you've been from coast to coast. Yeah. What's the reaction in the Jewish community to the three of you? Well, that's just, uh, I feel so thankful for that. It's just embracing the series, welcoming us in such a fantastic way. Of, it, it, it just warms the heart to see the reactions of people to the show. Are you surprised? I'm still surprised as anyone watched it. I told you, I read the pages. It was so good, but no one would watch it. And it's like, let's just make something amazing that no one will see. And, and everybody's seen it. And anybody, if you haven't seen it, you have an assignment. You've got to see it. Listen. Thank you, Mark. You're it's fabulous. You, I, I adore you, so you. And by the way, here's what you must promise me. Yeah. When you come to Hollywood, and you become a mega star, <laughs> you will still come on L'Chaim and talk to me. Uh, yeah, Is we'll do L'Chaim the next time, though. <laughs> All right. Okay, very good. The marvelous cast of Shtisel. You already met Dove Glickman, Ned Riskin, and this is Michael Ohlone. Wildly talented. And the entire cast brings his head to a slice of the Haredi world in a superbly done television series. It's available free to anyone who watches Netflix, who has Netflix. And as Michael said, if you're, when, you're done with, when you're done with Stiesel, then go to his second series on Netflix called... When Heroes Fly. When Heroes Fly. It will pop up anyway. It will pop up, yeah. okay, okay. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of the Chaim. By the way, do you watch Stiesel? How have you enjoyed this series? I'd love to hear from many of you. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And remember, you can now listen to L'Chaim on the L'Chaim podcast, available on iTunes or Google Play, wherever you listen to your podcasts. So take L'Chaim with you and listen again to my conversation with Michael Aloni. Special thanks on this edition of L'Chaim to our producer, Tisha Bader, who did a marvelous job of putting this edition of L'Chaim together. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.